DC, welcome into the Bliss. How are you doing this morning? Well, good morning, Martin. Doing great, thank you. All right. Well, so so DC, um, did you uh, survive this uh, snowstorm on Tuesday? I, mean, the no st- I call it the no snowstorm. Uh, the no snow, the no storm. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Storm. <laughs> yeah we, we, you know, uh, my wife gets on to me because she always goes, "It's better be safe than sorry." I said, "Baby, I have no problem with them being safe." I said, "The only thing I have is that when I when I came on the air on Tuesday, when I left my house, it 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 had barely rained. The ground was not even wet in some spot." The most dangerous thing I encountered on my way to the uh, station was when I hit the uh, salt and sand, I mean, the sand on the bridge <laughs> coming across <laughs> instead of the snow. So I said, that, that could have made me slide. But she said, well, I said, I understand it. But he didn't have to stay on the radio for, I mean, TV. He stayed on to 8 o'clock from 3 to 8. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's the problem I have, you know. That's, that's the problem I had. I mean, anyway. I, I I appreciate James Spann and the weather people and helping keep us safe, but uh, th- you have to have fun when something like that happens. You have oh, to talk. Of you got to laugh about it. Uh, it's just one of those things, though, where you have a, everybody can predict where they want to predict it, but you and I know Martin as believers, only God <laughs> controls the weather. That's, that's right. He just wanted to remind everybody. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the no storm. That's good what someone said. So. Anyway, uh, I know I even ask you, c- could you think of a bigger bust than the snowstorm that was predicted? Just kidding. No, <laughs> not, not really. <laughs> I think Alabama would blow out uh, Clemson, and I, I guess that was my biggest bust. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, I, we probably all could pick pick the uh, flipperoo on what would that be? The Clemson Alabama game would be what? A 42 point swing by most predict- predictions. Mm-hmm. Because most of us had anywhere from ten to fourteen point victory for Alabama, and they lost by twenty eight. And uh, yeah, so let's move on past that. Uh, well, not really. Josh Jacobs had a great article. Yeah, um, and, and I thought it was good. Uh, but I guess my question to you is: It was that was that article legit? Was was that a legit? Uh, uh, rationale or reasoning about behind what you saw on that in that national championship game, or was it kind of one of those uh, revisionist history excuses? Well, I, I think it was legit for two reasons. First of all, I think the uh, you got to put it in context with when he, when he was being asked the question, mm-hmm. and uh, and I think it was you know during this time of his going into the uh, NFL and getting. The, invited the combine and, and all the things he has going forward. And I, I think he was he was legitimately given a good right answer. Uh, the answer, the true answer. Because the if you read closely and I like to read between the lines when you read the article, uh, the the person who he, who was who was talking with him was kind of leading him into the idea that it was complacency that it got Alabama where they were in that position. Right. And and I think because he didn't buy into that uh, he didn't let them write the narrative. He actually became truthful, and I, and I believe he was he's one of the fir- first ones to actually tell the truth uh, in, in this in this area. Because I think all the other excuses have been made for out why Alabama lost, uh, but no one. I think he, it's the first time I've heard a player from the inside or a coach or a, or an individual from the inside say uh, what he said. And, and what he said. The second reason I think it's true is what he said. You always got to judge what someone says by looking at the facts around it and. If you look at the facts that surround the, the game and those things leading up the game, uh, what he said makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and speaking of what you're talking about, what he said was just that journey um, of of being the champion, uh, being the chase, being the hunt that you always get the other team's best uh, effort week in and week out, and you know having played the game that that's really hard for. Uh, potentially for fans who've never played competitive sports to understand that you may be playing playing someone who whose helmet is not impressive, but they prepare for you uh, and execute against you many times at a much higher level. Most, most definitely, you don't have to look any further in Alabama's last season than the Arkansas game. You know, Arkansas probably played above their heads when they played Alabama, uh, and you know, Alabama didn't didn't take them seriously, I, I don't think. And, and uh, it was a tough game for them to win, but 
every game that Alabama played, the, they got the best game of the, of the team. And the other thing I think that what he was saying, if you kind of read between the lines, was he said we, we got everybody the best game and we, and we played the SEC. I know everybody says, you know, the SEC, so what? But when you think about it, playing all the teams that Alabama played in the SEC coming forward, and when you get to the end of the season and you've got a perfect record and, and that the pressure is, Man, now I got to win the next game. I got to win another game, the SEC championship <laughs> game against the best in our league on the other side, and, and and you get hyped up for that game, and you prepare for it, and you have a long time to prepare for it, and then you in, in all season you've been looking forward to it. The pressure, the mental pressure, is on you. and then you win that game, and then you said, well, now I got to win another game to get in the championship game, and yeah. you go up against the Heisman Trophy winner. Great explosive offense, and you and you work hard during that off time to really uh, make a point and stop them, and you beat beat them. And, and for a second there, you, you're excited. Then you got to say, "Ah, I, I got to play another game." Yeah, for the championship game. So what I think we've created with this college football playoff, and why I'm not for expanding it, is uh, you put these young men in positions of mental uh, fatigue, mental frustration, and and, and as you know, uh, you get a person mentally fatigued, mentally mentally exhausted. Uh, then they make poor decisions. And I think that's what Jay, that's what Josh Jacobs was saying. And, and I, I agree with that. Uh, I can remember that feeling that that he's talking about. I, I'll never forget um, when we <laughs> when we won our 12th game, uh, I mean our 11th game of the season, and uh, Coach Stallings was talking to us, and Coach Stallings was being interviewed by someone, and he said, Yep, we we we're eleven and zero, won twenty one games in a row, and we haven't won anything. Yep, <laughs> think about that for a second. <laughs> we we were twenty one and and zero uh, uh, going back to our, our junior season, and we had won nothing because we were the first team to have to play in that SEC you know championship game. And, and yeah, and it it, was it, someone else had determined that for you. Someone yeah. had that. Y'all were the first. Yeah. And someone else had decided, hey, <laughs> y'all going to be undefeated, and you're going to have to play another game just to get into the national championship game. Yeah, so it was it was it was really really a, a, a stressful time. And another another part, uh, DC, uh, when you look at what's happening with the Alabama football program and and the difference is uh, not all uh, postseasons are created equal. Exactly, uh, Georgia. Alabama's road to victory was Georgia, Oklahoma, and Clemson. Would that be one, two? No, that'd be two, three, no, two, four, and what what Georgia was what before? Number five? They were five, yeah. Yeah. Two, four, and five. And two, four, and five. And and Clemson. Number three didn't count. <laughs> huh? And the, and the third team, Notre Dame, really shouldn't have been third. We got two, two <laughs> yeah, that's five. right. And so, and so that that on itself. Now, and, and we'll carry this conversation over <laughs> DC. But we talked about the mental fatigue. What role do you think coaching played, uh, and distracted coaching played, and possibly some dissension in the coaching staff played? And we're going to, I'm going to let you think about that. And when we come back from break, I want you to think, because not only did Alabama have the mental side of what Josh talked about, for the fourth consecutive year, somebody important in the leadership role was leaving this team. And and how the playoff playoffs impact that. And, and if you really think about it, Alabama has not been a dominant team uh, in the in the championship since the college football playoffs. We've won two, but we've not been a dominant team. We've not been that with the, the 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 ones that Nick Saban won before versus the one he's won in the college football playoffs. We'll talk about that and the role that uh, potential this coaching staff played against Clemson as well as even in the prior things, prior game. All right, DC. As we were going to break, there we were talking about the coaches and the coaching staffs and and the impact and, and all of that. So, uh, just from that particular game, uh, do you think the added 
mental uh, fatigue uh, of the players, offensively and defensively, could have been impacted. And I think there was some different dynamics on both sides of the ball. On the offensive side of the ball, uh, do you think that the dual responsibility of Loxley being the head coach of Maryland and the D.C. of Alabama in this particular offense, uh, did it finally catch up with him in, in, in terms of play calling and preparation? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to say. I, I, I don't think you can say that it had no effect. I think it had it definitely had some effect. And I think if you look back now in hindsight, we can tell that uh, the offense wasn't clicking uh, as well as in other times. And it is, was that because of that reason? I look back to this. I think Josh Jacobs' idea of being mentally fatigued, mentally, mentally exhausted, is, is the reason we made some of those mistakes. And I think individuals on the field made some of those mistakes. But I think you, you always are looking for a leader, and, and Mike Locksley had been your leader the whole time. And if he wasn't there or you didn't feel like he was there, then your confidence in him uh, might have swayed a little bit. You know, I, I go back to just the truth of, of how I was raised. My my uncle Bud always told me you couldn't do two things at once, and I I remember that. And, and the reason what he told me one day was he said you ride, we ride horses a lot. You know that, right? And I said, yeah. I said, he said, he said I've never seen a man ride two horses at one time sitting on his tail. I've seen a man do it one time in a circus standing, but he was unstable every time he went around. And that's what happens when you try to do two things at once. You always you always have the chance to stray. So keep your mind on what you're doing. Don't ever let it stray, and only do one thing at a time. And I've tried to I, I understand that when you put it in perspective, you know, Mike Locks is not, not knocking him. He just had two things he was trying to do at one time. Uh, and if, you know, it's, it's possible that it, it did bleed over into some problems uh, that they weren't had not experienced previous to that and because he'd always been focused on one job, one, one goal. And, on the and, other side of the ball, yeah. defense, you, know, you just got a little problem. Of, there was just uh, in, inconsistencies and uh, probably some – uh, lack of direction and, and one true vision as to how things are going to be done, I think, on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, I'm going to go back to the offensive side for one second. First of all, let's give credit to Coach Venables for, uh, I think, a, a great game plan to disguise and to, hmm. to bring about some confusion. Because one of the questions I ask you up front is, is it legit or an excuse? And I think it can be both of those at the same time. I think it is some legit – uh, concern there that this team may be mentally fatigued or may have been mentally fatigued, but I also think it came down to uh, one team was better prepared than the other, even if there hadn't been the mental mental fatigue. Uh, the reason I the reason I <coughs> lean toward him possibly being distracted is because when 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 you're preparing DC, you get to that point where there's the overall game plan. And then there's the situational game plan. Uh, And the situational game plan is where you get into the, what are we going to do in third and one, fourth and one? What are you going to do when when you get to the red zone? What are you going to do in third and long? You see what I'm saying? And to me, in between the 20s, our game plan was awesome. You know, but go back and look. How uncreative were we? We we pretty much went wildcat every third and short, and we had no effect in the red zone. And to me, that's where I think the preparation or the lack of preparation and lack of focus potentially from your OC caught up with us. And I, I agree with you on that wholeheartedly. I think that's a, a glaring error uh, in our offense. You know, we had plenty of chances there with inside the red zone to, to make that a game, and it, even in spite of our mistakes. Right. <laughs> and it, just didn't, it just didn't happen. And another side to that, Martin, that goes hand in hand with that as far as the lack of preparation, lack of being ready, is yes, I give all kudos to Coach Venables. He had a game plan that was right for what we were doing. But in all past times, we, in that this year, when other, players, when other teams tried to catch on to what we were doing, we always had an adjustment made, either at halftime or in, uh, in, a, in, in a series, and we took advantage of what that defense gave us, gave us, and that's an opportunity for to to really reap some benefits of that defense. And I don't think that was done in this game. And I think that's another sign of of lack of preparation or not being able to to be uh, 
to make so many decisions on the fly because you hadn't, hadn't prepared for those uh, going into the game. So I, I agree with you. I think our inability to to complete the uh, complete the uh, drives in the red zone and our inability to adapt and adjust, make some adjustments, uh, shows kind of a, 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 a lack of uh, uh, preparation. Yeah, yeah. And then flipping over to the defensive side of the ball, I think a couple things uh, that we can look at. Speaking with DC, DC Capstone Report, uh, the Taco Casa hotline is open for business. If you want to call and ask a question or give a comment, uh, you're welcome to do that with DC. He's going to be on with us the entire show. 205-342-9904, the Taco Casa hotline is open for business. Uh, to me, two things kind of jump out uh, on that defensive side of the ball uh, that I hope is rectified with this coaching staff. You briefly mentioned it a little bit in, in your explanation, and one of those was uh, uh, I think there, there, were, there were potential, very, very high likelihood of division within this staff. Uh, two heads, uh, a two-headed monster uh, with this co-defensive coordinator. I've seen that before. Uh, but never have I seen it where we now know, uh, D.C., that that they actually had flipped the play calling. So right. so one guy technically gets demoted in the middle of the season. And you, you, you have to have still have that struggle from the from within the staff and from the players. Well, who do we follow? Who do we listen to? Who, where do they go? What, what do you think the potential of just, I mean, just pure – dissension potentially amongst the staff was uh, because of that move and change in play calling? Well, I, I think that, I think it was definitely present uh, during several of the, uh, uh, several of the times during the season. And you can see, if you go back now with hindsight, 2020 and look at the defensive performances, you can kind of see that bearing itself out. But, you know, up until this season, we've always had a distinct alpha defensive coordinator that, just calling the plays and that knows what he's doing. He's taking Coach Saban's defense and implementing it. And this time, you got to remember, we had uh, you know a new young defensive coordinator, never been defensive coordinator before. Uh, and then you know, Coach Saban brought in someone uh, in Pete Golding that was a defensive mindset. But I don't believe that that Tosh Lapoy and, and Pete Golding's philosophies were the same. And uh, I think we saw that bear out in some of the early play in defense. And I believe that when the change was made, then everybody, coaches, staff members, and players have an idea, you know, a change is made. Somebody else is calling the plays now. Our philosophy is changed. And I believe at that point in time, it became just an inconsistent. No, that, that, that sure it actually wouldn't happen. But, you know, everybody's, you know, everybody's human. That's right. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you, you're the play caller, and then all of a sudden the next one game, you're not the play caller anymore. Uh, that stings a little bit. And every time you have a chance to put in your two cents, you want to make it good. Uh, and, and, and a lot of times it's going to be different, uh, opposite of what you're, uh, the person who's now promoted above you. Uh, and it's tough to be consistent in those situations because you know, human nature just intervenes. And I, I think there was some dissension. Uh, I think there was some uh, bickering. Uh, and I, I think that distracted from the players and, and the coaches around them and, and getting a good uh, defensive game plan. Yeah, and like I said, I, I I don't want to ever be seen as making excuses for Alabama because they still had to go out and play the game, uh, and they didn't, and Clemson did. And I'm not saying if you go back and look at the history of Alabama and Clemson in national title games, this game may not have ended any differently in terms of who won because that coaching staff at Clemson has done what, um, uh, done the same thing. Uh, three consecutive years in the title game, uh, three consecutive times. Uh, and so I'm not saying Alabama would have won the game, but it definitely should not have been a 28-point uh, blowout uh, if we get these things addressed. Robert Saucier brings up a good point. I'd like to uh, – I want to close this part of the conversation out and, and flip over to maybe little Bama hoops. Uh, and and we'll, we may talk about the, in the coaching staff, uh, the current coaching staff. But before I do that – in your opinion, D.C., does Nick Saban, after seeing what's happened four consecutive years in championship games, uh, in the way his team has performed compared to the dominance they've shown throughout the remainder of the year, should he let these guys go? D uh, Robert Saucier saying, I know, I now think that if someone is leaving, 
and we know that in early December, then let them go. Uh, let someone else uh, have the prep time. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of, of holding on to DCs uh, that could be distracted? Well, you know, I think, uh, as again, remember hindsight is twenty twenty. We're looking at it from the backside. You know, I think going into it, you got your guy. You, you, you think your guy can handle it, and you believe he can. Now he's got some. He's got a track record to learn. So I think it's definitely in consideration going forward. At least it's not going to be a given that you're going to continue on. I think there's uh, Coach Saban at least has a consideration now to make a decision: do you continue on or do you, or do you not? And I think the, I think the question there being is. If you don't, do you have someone on your staff already that can fill that position and do a better job uh, and do just a good job? If you do have that, uh, then you, you make the change. But if you don't, I think you stick with the one that, that's gotten you that far and hope that they can concentrate enough uh, to, to see it through to the end. You know, I, I think uh, uh, you, know, you might put yourself in a worse position to give someone uh, the, the play calling duties that's not ready for it. Yeah, and we go back. Uh, we struggled defensively in the first game against Clemson. Kirby's leaving. We struggled offensively uh, and because you made the change it with one week against Clemson in week two. I mean, the second showdown that should have, if it, that was done early in December, Sarkeesian would have been much more prepared. The offense would have been much more prepared. Last year you had Jeremy Pruitt. This year you had Mike Loxley, and each unit that was dominant were not so in the championship game with the coach that was leaving. I don't think the guys do it on purpose. I just think, as you said, it's h hard to ride uh, two horses sitting down. So <laughs> I may have to steal that one for from you. <laughs> All right, we're speaking with DC, DC Capstone Report. You can find them at dccapstonereport.com. Coming back on the other side, we're going to talk about these coaching changes, and we'll wrap up the show talking about Bama hoops. You listen to a Friday edition of The Blitz with DC and the DC Capstone Report. DC, uh, is the Tino Sinceri and Apple White hires about that young quarterback room, not just Tua, but getting uh, Talia and Tyson, one of those guys, ready to be backups uh, this most, season? Yeah, most definitely. I, I was so excited about the Tino Sinceri hire. And then you know, late, I think it was a couple a day or so ago, I heard Apple White was in town uh, interviewing for the analyst job, and I was thinking, man, what a quarterback room. <laughs> uh, having Tua and, and these younger guys coming in, Mac Jones, if he is still in that room as well. I mean, you've got, you got a chance here for some great talent. I mean, uh, you know, a great quarterback uh, with coached in some great areas with some, and groomed some great quarterbacks. To have them as analysts in that room, Man, what a, what, a, what a great opportunity that they'll be for these young men. Yeah, absolutely. If they can get those guys to be there. I know Tino's already on staff, uh, but if they could also uh, be able to get Applewhite, I think that would be a huge get in that role. Uh, as an analyst, you'd have a former head coach, former coordinator, and former quarterback and quarterback coach uh, be invaluable in terms of what Applewhite would bring to the table. All right, let's talk a little basketball. Alabama <coughs> traveling down to Auburn. Alabama, once again, a big win at home. Uh, this team, can they take it, D.C., on the road? Well, I mean, I think I think Alabama has a chance to win every game on their schedule. I think it's proven that out in, in their play this year. You know, which Alabama team shows up, and as Coach uh, Johnson has said, the tale of two halves, which half we play. <laughs> If we put a full game together, I don't, I don't think there's any doubt that we can take on the road and beat Auburn, uh, just like we was able to take on the road and compete uh, and have a chance to win the game against Tennessee against the number one team in the nation. So I, I don't have any doubt of that. I, I think Alabama is taking it seriously, uh, preparing it the right way. I understand yesterday, first time in the history that uh, Coach Johnson's been there, that Alabama piped in artificial noise to get prepared for the crowd noise at, at Auburn. And, uh, and I think that's, a, that's part of it. When you go on the road, you're in a hostile environment, and Auburn is a very hostile place to play anytime an Alabama team goes in there. And I think sometimes our young teams have been uh, – we've, got, we've gotten blowed out there just because we, we – We're not prepared, we, yeah. We're not prepared, yeah. We're not prepared for that for what's going on with the, with the crowd noise. And, and, and in basketball, crowd noise is, is important. I, mean, I think we've seen that lately at Alabama, at Alabama with Coleman, students packing the place and why Coach – Johnson has been so adamant about reaching 
bigger in the atmosphere to get it, uh, you know, closer to the court and get the crowd closer to the court getting involved. I, I yeah. believe that that's an important advantage in a, in a basketball game. So Absolutely. if I was able to go in there and overcome that one thing, then they have a chance to beat Auburn. Yeah, and without a doubt, D.C., I think we have to have the worst configuration ever for students. Uh, it was absolutely packed out against Mississippi State, and they had some impact, but I could not have imagined what it would have been like for Mississippi State if behind that goal you had all of those students. And even with the changes, they're still not – it's better, but it's still not uh, as good if you put them behind the goal versus just on the sideline. But anyway, that's not what I want to talk about today, That, but that is coming. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, when it comes to uh, Alabama, uh, three-point shot, D.C., in terms of what they need to do to beat Auburn, uh, it appears, according to uh, Brandon Marcello, who is a reporter for Auburn, one of the uh, writers, he uh, is saying that Wiley, Austin Wiley, is still not going to be back. And with Alabama's recent success of getting to the hole against Baylor and especially against Mississippi State, uh, what do you see as the three-point shot, the three things Alabama needs to do to beat uh, Auburn? Well, over and, and every time in any basketball game you play, the number one thing you can do is limit turnovers. I think Alabama has to limit the turnovers and, and giving the ball to, to them. And if they do that, they have a position to win for sure. The second thing I think it's important for Alabama to do, especially against this Auburn team, is spacing. I think our spacing on offense, our spacing on defense has to be stellar in this game to stop them uh, in the game they like to play, but also to take advantage of the game we like to play, which leads us to the third point. Is if Alabama can 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 get the spacing correctly, then there uh, is a great opportunity for us to make pick up some points in the paint. Uh, we've done a really good job against Baylor. We did a good job against Mississippi State in that area, and, and I really believe that uh, that that's an important in this game against Auburn to take advantage of points in the paint. Don't just live or die by the three point shot. Let the three point shot complement the paint. It, it, in basketball, if you can get the spacing correctly, work yourself in to getting points in the paint. The other team is going to have to, to have to adjust to that and, and, and collapse in the paint, and then you kick it out for the three. If Alabama does that in this game, I think they have a chance to win it against Auburn. If it's a close game, we're going to have to hit our three throws, and that's a, that's a, that's a, I threw a fourth one in there just because that's been a problem <laughs> uh, for Alabama down the street. Yeah. But I, I keep saying that, but I want, to, I want to say one thing on your show. I've always harped on how bad we are at free throw shooting, but I just want to, I want to give credit when credit is due. You know, uh, Dante Hall has improved his free throw shooting this year. Big Those time. people don't don't look at that. They 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 kind of say, "Well, how bad we are." But you're talking about a guy that notoriously shot 50 percent, uh, high, low 60 percent, uh, up to his game this year in the 70 range. So, uh, you know, I, I will give Dante Hall credit. He has uh, increased his free throw shooting, and I think he's been better down the stretch uh, in cr- in crisis moments in terms of knocking down uh, free throws as well. Speaking with DC, DC Capstone Report. DC, when you look at uh, this team, um, just give us a, a quick uh, analysis of 2018 19 versus 2017 uh, 18 team from, from last year. Well, I think Alabama stood around in 20, uh, last year and, and watched and waited for Colin Sexton to bring the game. Uh, and I think this year Alabama has got a team. Uh, mentality where on any given night uh, someone can have a big night but most of the time we're looking for everybody to get 13, 14, 12 points uh, and dominate your opponent with a team effort and I think that in reality I love this when we had Colin Sexton and without Colin Sexton we would have never made the tournament last year, no doubt about it Uh, but uh, I like this team better, I think it's a better team uh, than when we had uh, last year nothing against Colin Sexton, I just think that uh, he was so good uh, that everybody around him was waiting to see what he was going to do, let him dictate the speed of the game and the way the game was going to be played. And this year, uh, you know, I think we got ten players, ten players deep that are contributing, uh, uh, maybe eleven, and, and we're seeing people like Galen Smith now come on here lately and, and helping in the paint, which is great for uh, for Dante Hall to give him some help down low. And you got uh, been able to dribble and drive the basketball uh, and kick out some good three point shooters. So. I think team-wise, uh, we're, we're in better position than we were last year. I think we're in better position to make the NCAA tournament, Martin. If you look at the rest of our schedule and what we can accomplish, uh, if we just win the games that we're favored in, you know, we'll be we'll be good, possibly uh, won 20 games this year and, and win, pick up another game in the tournament. 
or two, then we could uh, possibly be our biggest uh, biggest year ever and make it to the tournament. All right, that's DC DC Capstone Report, and I hope that we'll also do something that Avery's been doing the last few games, and that's put Jace. I mean, John Petty with his back to the goal and take advantage of some of the smaller guards that Auburn has. So we'll see if that's the key to victory. You got the Tide or the Tigers in the Iron Bowl? Well, I got the Tide, Mitchell. I think Alabama goes down and uh, beats Auburn in this game. I think it's a close game. I think Alabama can't win a close game.